Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly webcast series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified Alzheimer care consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors. So today I'm going to step away from the topic of dementia and profile another very, very important illness with regard, which is called cancer. You know, as the COVID, pan COVID pandemic is hitting, many millions of people are currently suffering from this illness as well. And it, it impacts not only the individual who has a disease, but the ca caregivers as well. And I have the great pleasure of uh, interviewing and introducing my friend and one of my mentors, Gwen Nakos. Gwen Nakos founded Cedars Can Support after recovering from bladder cancer in 1988. While undergoing treatment, she noticed that many people receiving cancer therapy did not have personal or family connections to provide the practical and emotional support that she found so essential to her own recovery. Ms. Nackles will share the story behind why she founded Cedars Can Support, a program at the McGill University Health Center that works in collaboration with the healthcare team to improve the quality of life of cancer patients and their families. This dedicated team of professional staff and volunteers provides free emotional support, educational services, complimentary therapies, and practical resources. Gwen, welcome to our program. Thank you, Claire. Good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you too. And you know, um, many years before I even came to know you, you were one of the people, um, you know, in our community that I really looked up to. And I thought, you know, this woman has taken a very challenging situation in her life and just done something with a challenging situation to better the lives of other people. And, you know, when I was going through my challenging times that you're one of those people that I said, I want to be just like her. So I'm Thank very, very, very privileged to interview you. Trust me, if it had been reversed, I would have looked to you as one of my inspirations and mentors. Oh, You're doing a wonderful job in such a needed area. Congratulations to you. It's wonderful the work you're doing. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm really happy you're here today because I really feel that your story and your journey can really help so many others. So why don't we begin and, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, what happened to you and, 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 and the journey that you've been on. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll preface it just by saying I can tell my journey, and I have many, many times over the years, always with the hope that it is inspirational or comforting in some way to others because there is help out there now and we need you to know about all the different uh, services and, and whatnot that are available to you. So it's an opportunity for me to reach out to people. And my story is my story. It's not necessarily anybody else's story. And I think that's important to bear in mind through this webcast and other times that when people who have been patients are talking about their experiences, it's important that people don't think, well, that is what's gonna to happen to them in terms of a diagnosis or treatments or anything. Um, what's really important is that I can provide perhaps some, some inspiration and hope, but you have your own unique cancer journey. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sometimes I have been reluctant to talk about the details only because I don't want people to think, well, Gwen said this and Gwen was like this, this happened to her. So all that as a preface to my story, I was 38 years old. I was um, a new mother. I had a one-year-old son and uh, my husband's two daughters from a former marriage had just moved in with us uh, about a year before. So I was a new mother to three children, an infant and two others. And life was good, life was good. And I noticed blood in my urine, a, a, a quite a, a bit of it. And I 
didn't pay much heed to it, except it happened again in a very short period of time. Just sort of, I happened to mention it to my husband. He said, get it checked, get it checked. And ordinarily, because there was no pain associated, I was gonna let it go thinking, oh, it's just an odd thing. At 38, I was not worried about a lot of, you know, healthcare issues. Um, I did get it checked out and I was diagnosed with stage four med, uh, bladder cancer. Um, it really was not terribly on the radar screens of me or anybody I knew. Um, you heard about breast cancer, you heard about other cancers, but bladder cancer. And bladder cancer profile at the time was a 68 year old heavy smoking man who might be working in a toxic environment where there might be toxins. And I certainly didn't fit that profile. Um, so I was diagnosed, I had surgery, um, extensive surgery. Um, I think for anybody who's had uh, bladder cancer and you certainly are hearing about it more often today, uh, there are many different kinds of bladder cancer. Mine was, uh, I had a tumor large enough that they had to remove not only the tumor, but the bladder. So I've had an ileoconduit um, since I was 38 years old, almost more than half my life. How did you, I just want to stop you now, when you were told, when you were sitting in that doctor's office and you were given this diagnosis, like, how did, how did you react? Like, how? Well, and he, here's something that's kind of interesting to tell. I wasn't sitting in the doctor's office when I was told. I didn't know. I had a few scans and I had a call from the doctor's secretary. And she asked me where I wanted to go, which hospital. And I said, well, what are my choices? And she said that the Royal Victoria Hospital, where I ended up being treated, I would get in faster. And I said, well, why, what's this all about? And she said, well, you have CA. I didn't know what CA was. I, I wasn't, I didn't know the, the vocabulary of the cancer world. She said, you have cancer, you have bladder cancer. And you know, there are many, many, many conversations I've had over the years with people I've heard that the way they've been told has been very difficult for them to accept. And I use that as an example, that that's one way you don't take a, tell a patient. I should have been brought into the doctor's office and told you know, properly and appropriately. So I was left speechless and I go to my husband and I tell him I have bladder cancer. He says, what's that? You know, what does this all mean? So a lot of confusion, a lot of um, worry, insecurity, as you, as you can imagine. But eventually I was um, referred to another doctor and that doctor was a blessing and um, he helped me tremendously. And even when I went for a second and a third opinion outside of, of the city, outside the country, he offered to make those appointments himself or his office would, which was a wonderful source of relief to me. So I had uh, surgery um, and I weathered that all right. As I had said earlier, it was very extensive. And for a 38 year old woman who was wearing bikinis on the beach, I was going to someone who was going to be, my body was gonna be very different. I, I would have to treat it differently. I would have to dress differently perhaps. Um, I weathered that and then I did have a couple of other opinions on whether I needed chemo. Cause when I was told I needed chemo, I was shattered. I thought I had gone through so much. I had some preoperative radiation and then I had this extensive surgery, which to me was body changing. And then I had to go through chemo and that was a terrible blow, but that's when I went for the second and third opinions and I was told that without chemo, I really did not have a chance of, uh, of living more than a few years. Now, I'm talking about my specific bladder cancer. Um, I have a couple of friends right now who are diagnosed with bla bladder cancer and their, their types of tumors are very different than mine. They're going through very different treatments, maybe no chemo, but radiation. So I, I do bring this out again, because I don't want people to say, well, she's healthy after all these years, and nobody suggested to me surgery or this, we're all different and our tumors are all different. Um, so I, I had the chemo, got through that, lost all my hair, 
definitely remember being in the shower one morning and feeling, my eyes were closed, feeling that uh, there was water around, swirling around my ankles. I looked down and I saw a mass of hair that was blocking the drain. And every time I just touched my head, I had clumps of hair and I cried and I cried. Well, and you, I, I want to ask you now, as you're going through all of these changes, you're, were you provided any information by the, by the healthcare community, like to expect this to happen? You know, were you accompanied by anybody at that point? I mean, what, in terms of what to expect that this was good, that these, tra these transitions were going to happen to you? As far as was I accompanied, yes. And it was, you know, you, you've asked me why I started Cedars Can Support. And it was because I would look in around the faces in the waiting room when I would be there for my treatments or appointments. And I always had someone with me, a friend or a family member. But I looked around the, the sea of faces and people looked at distress. Many of them were alone. Um, a lot were of you educated more, but the question I guess would be more, were you educated? Did you, were you aware that this was going to happen to you with the chemo that you were going to lose your hair? Were you aware that all this was about to happen to you? No, a lot. I didn't know who to ask questions of, but more, even more, I didn't know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And it was my friends or my family members who spoke up and said, well, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? So they prompted mm -hmm. a lot of the help that I got from them, but there were no supportive care services. I don't remember, but I don't think it was even that small booklet that's put out by the Canadian Cancer Society, which is available to everybody. No, I, I felt very much on my own. It was, and I always felt I didn't want to take too much time of the doctors and nurses because they were so busy caring for other people too. Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting comment that you just made though. Like saying, I don't want to, like, this is your life, right? This is your life. And you're saying, I don't want to take up too much time from the doctors and nurses because they're caring for others. Meanwhile, you're in stage four cancer. I know. You don't want to ask questions. Isn't that interesting? But somehow I felt that I was privileged because I had family and friends who were asking questions. Plus they were there to support me. But all these other people out there didn't look like they had the resources I did. Mm -hmm. And I felt that if I was asking too much, I was taking the doctor's time away from somebody else. And I think I'm, I still feel that a little bit today. It's, it's I guess, part of my nature. Mm -hmm. But it's so important, as we've discussed, how important education is, um, that we do have to take care of our own health and um, not in, not. 30 some years ago, uh, 36 years ago uh, this year that I was diagnosed, there just, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't the, the, the opportunities to engage with uh, professional staff or casually with others, you know, there was no support going on around there. Mm -hmm. And, and so how did you, so because I want to talk to you after about, because you recently had an, a di another diagnosis, but I want to talk to you about how did, you, how did your first diagnosis lead you to become an advocate in the field of cancer and make you decide to, like, how did Cedars Can Support begin? Yeah, a few things started to come my way. There was a nurse who asked me if I would be on the patient's committee because they needed some representation from the cancer areas. So that led me to think, ooh, maybe I can help somewhere. I can, I, I, I can get involved. Um, I think it was my, I was asked to join the board of directors of the Cedars uh, Cancer. Today it's the foundation. It was called the uh, fund in those days. I was asked to get involved and my husband was approached to make a donation. You know, he was an easy mark. And I, at my very first meeting of the, of the board for me, listening to some of the conversation going on, I realized that there could be this supportive care service and perhaps Cedars would be interested in sponsoring it and funding it. So I mentioned it to them they said, bring us back a proposal, which I did the following month. And they loved it. They thought it was great. So it started to take shape from my experiences and as I started to talk to other people, patients, 
because when you're in the waiting room, you very often start speaking with the person next to you or across the way. Um, the first thing I did in starting it was, I said, well, there are volunteers in the clinics and that in those days radiation was given at the Royal Victoria Hospital as well as, you know, as, well as chemo. So I went to the volunteers who were in those areas. I said, you know, I wanna start this supportive care service. We'd like to have all of you who are currently working with the patients become part of us. And, you know, our, our name eventually became Cedars Can Support. Would you join us? And of course they all said yes. And one of the volunteers uh, at Can Support has been since 1988, 1989, she, one of them is still volunteering with us and she just shared with us she's 89 years old and, mm. and she's great. That's amazing. So I, 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 so I said for this to work, it has to work within the system. Mm -hmm. So I went to the volunteers who were there, will you be part of us? Then I started to become introduced to the nursing director at the head of um, uh, the medical professional services with the ethics committee. I, I went to absolutely everybody who I thought would have any sort of a relationship with um, a cancer supportive service. And they all said, this is great. Many of them said, oh, we've wanted to do something like this. We've just needed someone to get it going, to kickstart it. So it wasn't a novel idea to provide more help and information, but it was the nurses were becoming increasingly um, less able to spend the time on an initiative like this, but many of the nurses said, we need this, we need this. Mm -hmm. So I was only welcomed with open arms. Um, but as I said, it I definitely wanted to work within their system, get to know their system. We couldn't be seen as an adversary in any way. And from the very get-go, we've said, we do not provide medical uh, information at all. And we, we, docu we say that everywhere, we put it everywhere that our suggestions should never replace any sort of medical advice. Right, you're like a complement to the medical. Totally, medical. totally, yeah. totally. Well, I wanna ask you now, so you, you recover from stage four cancer. I mean, you know, first of all, how did that impact you emotionally? Cause that was a real, it was very traumatic, that whole experience. And then not only how did it impact you emotionally but what was the impact that it had on your family? much different the first time than the second time. Because the first time my son was a year old, he didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. and, and the girls were nine and 14, maybe 10 and 15 by then. Um, they were probably a little bit overwhelmed by it, but they had a lot of other things going on in their lives. And you never know when the children are 10 and when they're 15, how important a parent is um, going through a cancer diagnosis versus, you know, what their friends are wearing that day or what they say about them. So I'm, I, I, I was lucky I had help at home to keep things going. And again, that's something else that I, I say how fortunate I am that I did have assistance and so many people don't have it. Um, I think the kids were a lot more impacted this time. I was diagnosed with colorectal cancer a year ago. And, you know, I've been living and they have by, by association with me, been living the cancer world for the last, you know, 36 years with my involvement. So I think that, you know, they wouldn't let me go alone. So I, again, I was, I was accompanied by one of my kids. Um, and they've been fabulous, you know, I've just, and I think they've been impacted more maybe because they know, you know, if you get another cancer, maybe it's different than just getting one cancer. I didn't know what questions or fears they had, but they certainly wanted to keep me healthy. And they were very, very present and wanted to go to the doctors because they wanted to make sure because as I said earlier, I feel a little bit guilty if I take too much time from a, from a doctor or a nurse or um, a dietitian. And uh, they were there making sure that the right questions were being asked and we were getting answers for them. So they, were, they, they wanted to be there with me and they have been. 
Well, how were you impacted emotionally now by the by the second time around? I, and I and you know you had just recently made me aware of it. I wasn't aware that you have you've just been through this again. How how did you react to that? I mean, after being missing for so many years. Well, I think I focused on the positive, and the positive was that it was diagnosed very early and it was very treatable. So when I was having tough time and I, I really, really had a tough time for about two and a half months post treatment, immediately following my, the end of my radiation and chemo, um, I just kept saying, well, all of this must be worth it going through these horrible side effects if it was caught early and it's very treatable. So there, it was, it made me think of the people who don't have that prospect of an early diagnosed cancer that can be very, you know, very treatable. And I just, again, felt that I was very fortunate that I was diagnosed early and it was a bit of a fluke that led to it. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, you know, it, it throws your whole world off for mm -hmm. sure. And what type of like psycho, you know, psychological support um, does the healthcare system provide? I mean, because I'm, I'm, I guess, fortunate to not have experienced cancer, but you know, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, as a patient, you know, in addition to the medical community that is there for you, is there some psychosocial support as well? Like, well, you know, you you asked me uh, one of the things that you asked me to address was. Um, what a, what advice, no, sorry, what areas within our healthcare system need improvement? Yeah. I, that's a great one. It would be nice if the government would recognize the need for supportive care and fund it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a fairly significant uh, department of called supportive care and supportive uh, care and palliative care at the MUHC, the McGill University Health Center. But see, the Cedars Cancer Foundation is, is providing probably half the, half the support, financial support for that. Right. In other words, it has to come through private donations, through foundations, through philanthropy, mm -hmm. that some of these things exist. Our psychosocial oncology department was mandated to provide that service by the government, the Quebec government many years ago, many, many, a few decades ago, but there was no money to support it. So in order to have higher psychologists, you need money and that has come through our foundation, the Cedars Cancer Foundation. Okay, so there's not necessarily, I mean, I, what I've, you know, found amazing among my along my own journey as 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 a caregiver, you know, caring for my mom, or even as a pay, I've been a patient of the MUHC for for many many years. There really wasn't any support with regards to trauma or or grief. You know, I mean, I recently in January and February went through my own serious health challenges, very very scary challenges, and you know, there was there was no psychological support for that. And, and, you know, for somebody that is having severe health issues, I think that, that you're right, that, that that's really missing. And it's something that needs to be needs to be addressed. It's not just sending the patient home and here's the go fill your prescription at the pharmacy. And that's it. It's like, okay, what other support are you going to have to recover from such a an, an experience? Right? You know, there's so much help out there. Um you know, advice to, you know, what, what advice would I give to anybody, whether they be a patient or a caregiver, if they're diagnosed with cancer is what I, my advocates did for me, it was ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And if you don't get the, an answer, keep following up until you do. And it's one of the things that we can do at Cedars Can Support. So we say, if you don't know where to go, you don't know whom to ask ask us. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the answer, we'll help you find the answer. Mm -hmm. so I think the second wave I had with treatment showed that the difference between the first time when I was diagnosed, when there was nothing available in terms of supportive care services, mm -hmm. although a few of the hospitals, the Jewish General Hospital, for instance, had uh, their Hope and Cope program, which had been started just a few years before us. Um, and Notre Dame, uh, had something called Virage. So some of the hospitals had it. They were all a bit fledgling, I think, uh, like us. But, you know, thank goodness for those. But today, and 
being impacted today versus 36 years ago, then there was not much available. Today, there is so much. But unfortunately, it's easy to fall through the cracks mm. because there's so many people being treated for cancer. And even though I was hooked up with a dietitian, with a social worker, with um, unbelievable number of, of, in the supportive care services. So to look at um, prehabilitation, you know, being prepared, how could I deal with the pain that I was dealing with? Um, the sleeplessness I had. There's so many more services available, but sometimes the staff will pick up, the nurse or the doctor will say, oh, I think you should be referred to maybe a psychologist, for instance, mm -hmm. or psychosocial. Um, I think you should be, but there's times where maybe that's missed and it's too bad that the patient and the, and the caregiver is not aware of them. So mm -hmm. read copious ask questions mm -hmm. but you know it's important to go to reliable sources mm -hmm. we have a library and I think the library is one of the cornerstones of of the services we provide because mm -hmm. we have so much education educational materials there we have um, a lot of brochures and whatnot we you know wigs turbans and whatnot mm -hmm. so our, our and our librarian is constantly trying to reach out to people and address the issues. But it's really up to us as well, yeah, as patients, to find out what's out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before I ask you to talk about the programs and services that are offered, um, wh what role should the caregiver play really, like the family or informal caregiver? Like what, you know, how could that, what, what would be their best role in, in all of this? Well, I, I, I must say that at least at, at our hospital, the family member, the caregiver is addressed and is considered really as important as the patient. Mm -hmm. And all of our services, for instance, and I think anything you see with the MUHC would, but definitely with ours, it's for patients and caregivers, family members. And quite a few of the services, uh, and I'll mention some of the yeah. ones, uh, quite a few of our workshops and services are available to the caregivers as well. Their role is critical. We hear so many times questions, concerns coming from the caregivers mm -hmm. that the patient isn't saying. But it's the caregiver who very often is, is the spokesperson for the, the patient. It, it's, it's definite. They definitely are the, the patient's advocate. And you're the perfect example because you were the one who said, I don't want to disturb the doctor, the nurses, but thankfully your, your, your family members were, were your voice, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it encouraged them to become educated and informed too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so they could, if there were decisions to be made, that they could uh, participate in making the decisions. So please tell us what, what programs and services are offered. Also, you know, given, given the restrictions of COVID, what's still available, what's not available? Tell okay. us. About All right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just put a plug in now for it, but everything is available on cansupport.ca. So it's, it's, it's a, web, a living website. You know, it's, we're constantly changing it, but it's, it's, it's quite wonderful and, and it's quite up to date. Um, Information and educational material, for instance. So through our libraries, we can we can offer, I think we have thousands of pieces of information uh, that we can pass on, on, to, on to patients. Um, we do put on webinars, webcasts. Uh, it used to be in person, you know, now things, you know, the doctors, it's one of the services that's still ongoing now, even through COVID. Um, that the doctors, some of the experts are, are, are talking about different facets of cancer and the care. Um, practical, we have wigs that we provide free of charge. Uh, we have turbans. We have lists of wig stores. You know, if people need resources, we're a resource center. You know, we disseminate information if we can't do it. Um, parking had been, hasn't been in the past an issue. We helped people get a reduced parking pass. Mm -hmm. um, lots of, uh, there, there's just so many things that, that, that we can provide support groups and workshops. And that's, these are going on now and it's amazing. Um, 
we're are busier in person or are they virtual support groups oh, everything is virtual um can support has uh probably well i won't say how many active volunteers because everything is is different right now with covid but uh, we have uh, regular volunteer meetings and um, training sessions that are going on. So we're, our staff is busier than ever. We have a staff of six and they're busier than ever. We are um, our usual ones and some of the ones we have now, I'll tell you generally what the support groups can be. They're French and in English. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're separate, sometimes they're bilingual. Mm -hmm. um, we have had in the past adolescent and young adult support groups, support groups for breast cancer patients, those with metastatic breast cancer, newly diagnosed patients, bereavement support group, and a workshop on brain fog, which I think I'm suffering from, <laughs> where our, our memories are not what they used to be. Um, and complementary therapies, which are, include yoga and Reiki, art, um, art therapy, music therapy, massage therapy. We have so many, and we're linked in with others. So if you go on uh, cansupport.ca and you're interested in certain things, we have links to other services you know, within the, within the community. Uh, humanitarian funds, um, we've had some very generous be benefactors over the years who provide monies for us to give out to needy patients and family members. It's all done through social services. And sometimes people can't pay their rent. They can't pay their electric bill. So we help them. Sometimes they're too ill to take public transportation to the hospital. And, you know, patients are yeah. still being seen at the hospital. Yeah. Um, and it's probably more important than ever today that people realize all the different things we have uh, in terms of services, because they're isolated, yeah. you know, with no volunteers to make them feel welcome, you know, when they come for their treatments. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're short staffed because many of the staff have been pulled away, you know, uh, for COVID uh, treatments. But it's it's amazing that you've been able to keep going with all these programs and services because one of the challenges with COVID, people are afraid to go into the hospitals or thinking that there's no services available. So the fact that you've been able to maintain such a gamut of programs and services is truly remarkable. Unfortunately, they're only virtually. They're yeah. not in the hospital. Yeah. yeah. Um, our staff is all working virtually. Our volunteers are not allowed in the hospital yet. They're, you know, for the obvious reasons. But just to give you an idea of what's going on now, um, yoga, meditation and relaxation, Reiki, art therapy, look good, feel better, new patient orientation, support groups, facing cancer at a distance is what we call it. And then uh, our volunteers are being trained now to do volu uh, uh, volunteer telephone support so because they can't meet them face to face it will be through zoom or through skype whatever so we are very active i think our staff is busier than ever with what's going on and again cansupport.ca gives the the current calendar of what's happening this season and it's updated as i said you know all the time when you are a truly remarkable woman and I cannot thank you enough for being on our webcast today and, and sharing all of your story and everything that you've accomplished. Like, thank you, really thank you so much. You're gonna benefit so many people. I hope so, I hope so. Thank you, thank you for being on our show. Um, next week on McGill Cares, we will be having a much requested topic. It's called planning for the future and protecting a loved one's finances. And my guests are both graduates of McGill University's Faculty of Law, Rhonda Ruddick and Janet Michelin. Um, this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at www.mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have specific topics or questions that you would like us to address during our weekly webcasts, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. 
Until next week, please take care of yourselves and of your loved ones. Thank you for watching.